five, four, three, two, one. We're live. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I want to welcome you to the June 4th, 2012 Morganton City Council meeting. Uh, I'm appreciative of all the people that have come tonight and looking forward to uh, having a good meeting. At this time, I'll call on Sheldon Stevenson to lead us with our invocation. Steve. The Bible holds before us two strong commandments. One is that we are to love God with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. The second is that we are to love each other even as we love ourselves. Let us pray. O oh, Holy God, help us to experience in our lives something of your holiness. Help us to experience your love for us and to share your love with those who seem quite unlovable. You have given us each of us sacred life to live. So help us, O Holy Lord, always to have a respect for ourselves and what we mean. We give you thanks, O God. Grant us thy wisdom, grant us thy mental and spiritual vitality. And we thank you. Amen. Thank you, Steve. I appreciate it. Uh, at this time, I'll introduce our city council. On my far right is Dr. Alfred Hamer, city councilman, city councilman Forrest Fleming, city attorney uh, Louis Vina, I'm Mel Cohen, your mayor, Sally Sandy, city manager, Sidney Simmons, city councilman, John Cantrell, city councilman, Kelly Russell is the recording secretary, and Becky Brinkley is interpreting for our deaf community. Uh, we have a very lengthy meeting tonight. And um, again, I thank people for being here. It'll be interesting to see how many people are here when we uh, end up tonight. Uh, at this time, I'd like to call A.D. Mace to come. Where are you, A.D.? Come to this uh, podium over here. Right there, and I'll read the resolution honoring A.D. Mace. A.D. was employed by the city of Morganton as a part-time temporary status labor one in the Public Works Department on April 5th. 2004 and became a full-time permanent status maintenance worker in Public Works Street Department on September 20th, 2004. Whereas A.D. Mace has faithfully served the City of Morganton in the Public Works Street Department and has given of his time and efforts for the benefit of the citizens of Morganton for eight years. And whereas A.D. Mace retired from the City of Morganton as maintenance worker in the Public Works Street Department on June 1st, 2012. And whereas the Morganton City Council wishes to officially recognize the contributions of A.D. Mason, express their appreciation for a job well done. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the City of Morganton, the Mayor present this resolution to A.D. Mace. Adopted this the fourth day of June, 2012. Mel Cohen, Mayor Sally, Sandy, City Clerk, motion in form of motion, guys. Thanks. All in favor, say aye. 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 A.D., it's going to be unusual to not see you downtown. We know your phone number. <laughs> yes, sir. You say anything? Um, it's yours. I'm not. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Where's Mike? Mike, either one of the podiums. Resolution honoring Kelly Michael Mike Hassan. Whereas Kelly Michael Mike Hassan was employed by the City of Morganton as maintenance supervisor in the Recreation Department on April 6, 1992, and reclassified as Parks Maintenance Supervisor in Recreation on July 1, 2004. And whereas Kelly Michael Mike Hassan has faithfully served the City of Morganton in the Recreation Department and has given him his time and efforts for the benefit of the citizens of Morganton for 21 years and nine months. And whereas Kelly Michael Mike Hassan retired from the City of Morganton as Park Maintenance Supervisor in the Recreation Department on June 1, 2012. And whereas the Morganton City Council wishes to officially recognize the contributions of Kelly Michael Mike Hassan and express their appreciation for a job well done. Now therefore be it resolved by the City of Morganton to Mayor present this resolution to Kelly Michael Mike Hassan Adopted this the fourth day of June, 2012. Mel Cohen, Mayor, Sally Sandy, City Clerk. Make this in the form of a motion. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Mike, you notice I don't say any people against it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was looking at a, my peripheral here. 
I want to present this to you. Thank you, man. Thank you for everything you've done for the city and the citizens. These checks, you can endorse them. Nothing real. I'd just like to thank everybody here and the city of Morganton, the residents, for allowing me the opportunity to work for the city, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. I'll miss it, but I'll still be around. So you, thank you, guys. Thank Mike, you. I'll, I'll see you. Bye. I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> Take care. Okay. Uh, a public ad oh I'm sorry presentation of a service bin Scott where's Scott yeah, there he is. Scott I won't tell you that uh, hard to imagine you came about the same time I did <laughs> just like to take a minute I'd like to thank the men and women that I work with for the privilege of working with them and thank you for the direction the resources and the opportunity to do my job Thank you, Scott. Thank you, Scott. <laughs> Scott, you, AD, and Mike, and all have made helped make this community the beauty that it is, and it really, I mean it, your people. Public advocacy issues and strategies, I uh, just want to say a couple of words. The two farmers markets that we have, one is, of course, on the corner of Avery Avenue and uh, North, uh, North Green, uh, that is on Wednesdays from 2 to 6. And the regular farmer's market is on Saturday uh, down at the depot, uh, and it's, they're going extremely well. Uh, and the Friday night concerts continue on and are doing extremely well. Uh, now, Fort San Juan Historical Marker Proclamation. Uh, now, this is not you. Okay. Uh, uh, the Colonel Dames uh, 17th Century Fort San Juan Chapter. I'm going to read the resolution and I'm going to take it with me, I guess, to uh, out to the dig at Henderson Mill Road back on, what is it, June 28th or June 18th. 18th, June 18th. Fort San Juan Historical Marker Proclamation. Whereas a new historical marker is placed in Burke County on the site of Fort San Juan on Henderson Mill Road, Morganton, North Carolina. And whereas the members of the Colonel Dames uh, 17th, 17th, 17th century, the uh, Fort San Juan chapter are the sponsors of the markings of this educational and historical project. And whereas, the marker will honor Fort San Juan, which was settled on the site of the Native American town Gerara by Spaniard Juan Pardo and his Spanish expedition in 1566. Pardo built Fort San Juan in 1567, making it the earliest European settlement in the interior of the United States. In 1568, the fort was destroyed by ancestral Catawba Indians, thus ending Spanish colonization in North Carolina and opening the land to settlement by the British. And whereas this memorable event is important to all Americans, and especially North Carolina school children, as it gives them a look back into the colonial history and the formation of our great state. Now, therefore, I, Mel L. Cohen, Mayor of the City of Morgan, do hereby extend our best wishes to the colonial dames, 6th, 17th century, the Fort San Juan chapter and our appreciation for placing this historical marker on Fort San Juan on the 18th day of June, 2012, issued this the 4th day of June, 2012, Melcoin Mayor Sally Sandy, a city clerk, in the form of a motion. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. And we'll meet all the city council and all the citizens of Morganton out there on, on June 18th. 18th. At what time? Uh, what time is it? Do you know, Rachel? 11 in the morning that's right yeah it is in the morning and uh it's you know it's something that i think we're citizens are not aware of totally i mean a lot of the citizens but it is an unusual thing and uh look forward to being out there with all of you diane tate diane would you come to the podium if you would please proclamation honoring diane tate whereas diane tate is a lifelong resident of burke county and whereas when Morganton's Human Relations Commission was formed in the early 1990s, Diane Tate was one of the original members. And whereas Diane Tate has served continuously as a board member of the Human Relations Commission since its formation. And whereas Diane Tate has frequently served as an officer of the HRC. And whereas Diane Tate was elected as chairperson of the HRC in 2005. And whereas Diane Tate was again elected as chairperson of the Human Relations Commission in 2010. 
And whereas over the years, Diane Tate has devoted countless hours and great effort in the service of the Human Relations Commission, now therefore, as mayor of the city of Morganton, I hereby proclaim that Diane Tate should be and is hereby recognized for her many years of exemplary service on Morganton's Human Relations Commission, and that Diane Tate should be and is hereby recognized for her extensive involvement as a citizen and as a member of the community in not only the Human Relations Commission, but in many other aspects of the public, civic, and religious life of this great community, and that this proclamation should be spread upon the minutes of the Human Relations Commission and of the City Council of the City of Morganton. This the 22nd day of May 2012, Melcoin Mayor Sally Sandy, City Clerk, making the form of a motion. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Diane was the one that I called when we had a slight problem back in the early 90s. And Diane and some wonderful other citizens of Morganton and Burke County helped form the HRC, and to this day it's a very strong uh, entity in the city of Morganton. Diane, I want you to take this home. You and Oscar share it, okay? And by the way, she is the daughter to one of our longest, I don't know how many years, 50, 50 years. Uh, her father knew every water line in this community, backwards and forwards. And we, we miss him, and we're going to miss you, but you'll be back, I promise. <laughs> to God be the glory. Without him, nothing is possible. And I want to thank the C City of Morganton for allowing me to give service for the last 19 years on the Human Relations Commission. Thank you, and may God bless you. Thank you, thank Diane. You. Power Agency, Sally. Um, we had a regional meeting here last Thursday night. You all attended that at the community house. The CEO, Graham Edwards, presented a little bit of history about the power agencies, how we came to be, and a little bit about the future of the power agencies. And that's all at this time. Consent agenda, Sally. Okay. The consent agenda before you tonight includes five individual items. Those items are considered to be non-controversial and would ask that you consider approving those in one motion unless there's someone in the audience or on the council that would like an item removed and discussed separately. For those viewing at home, the items include regular uh, minutes from the regular meeting held on May the 7th, 2012, tax releases in the amount of $486.34, the uh, appointment of Louie as the second alternative commissioner to the uh, Power Agency Board, um, a budget amendment for Project Skelly, which is an economic development project, a rural center grant that we have going on. That total amount is $75,600. And then a budget amendment for the Western Piedmont Community College Project. A couple months back, you'll recall that we helped them in applying for a grant that is going to be used for the beginning study to rehabilitate the historic silo barns and we have been notified that we have received that award. That's great. Move approval of consent agenda. Second. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, appearances, Deborah Jones with the Burke Arts Council. Thank you for being with us tonight. Yes. No. Thank you for inviting me. Um, my name is Deborah Jones. I'm the uh, executive director at the Arts Council. I've been um, I've been here uh, since January, and um, I thank everybody for. I feel very welcome in this town, <laughs> city, and um, so I just thought I'd give you a little bit of uh, what we're up to at the Arts Council. Um, we have um, been working closely with uh, downtown Sharon uh, Jablonski in her office. Um, we're bringing back the uh, art crawl um, uh, the third Thursday of June, July, and August. Um, uh, we have a really great exhibit coming up that we are collaborating with um, Mesh Gallery and Calais Gallery. It's the uh, Studio North Carolina Studio Glass exhibit, and it's um, it's got some amazing, outstanding artists that will probably, it will bring some outstanding crowds to, uh, to Morganton. Um, and we also are having a fundraiser um, that you may have um, 
seen in the paper or heard about. It's the Burke Arts Council 400, and there's 400 tickets only that we're selling. They're $50 each, and the prizes are um, anything from a pair of bicycles to um, a subscription at Kama, um, a Bristol Motor Speedway NASCAR package, and um, there's, there's seven prizes. Uh, the grand prize is um, a trip to Italy. So the first drawing will be uh, June 16th at the uh, opening reception um, for the glass exhibition. And then throughout, like once a month throughout the end of the year, uh, we'll be doing a drawing. So I have packets here for everybody. Um, not everybody, but, um, but I didn't bring enough. But there's also membership. We're um, trying to build up our membership. And um, so there's lots of information in here. Um, do you have any questions? Baby, I meant to bring you the check tonight for the uh, drawing, and I forgot. I'm sorry. I'll bring it by your office tomorrow. Okay. Okay. It's a very, very enticing check. Checks in the mail. See, okay. I have great respect from these guys. They ch said the check's in the mail. I'm going to bring it by. Okay. All right. Thank you. Is there nobody has any questions? Or? Any questions, Deborah? Oh, okay. Let us know when you get the check, please. <laughs> Just call I'll in. You to pass. Okay. <laughs> I'm so uh, impressed with like the Roman thank numerals. Not <laughs> 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 over that yet. 17. <laughs> Any questions of Deborah? She's pumped new life into the Arts Council. Now you did say the Art Crawl is the third Thursday on June, July, and August. Okay. Okay. Uh, Rachel Ammons, Vice Chair of the Board of Directors of the Explorer Gerara Foundation. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. I've been asked to come and give you an update on our Catawba Meadows um, project. As you know, uh, there is a Native American site just behind the baseball fields in Catawba Meadow, and it will join eventually the Greenway, or you will have access to it from the Greenway. We have received um, a grant and we've put up two interpretive signs. On May the 26th, instead of having a ribbon cutting, we had a palisades raising. We uh, had volunteers out there who cut poles to make our palisade or to begin it. And we raised it and um, presented our interpretive signs at the same time. We have a long way to go, but we've started raising some funds. Uh, for, for this um, project. And what the project will entail is having a, a living history village with two um, Native American replications of houses and uh, a garden, a Native American garden with a, and a palisade around it. Eventually, we will use one of the buildings near the concession area to house a museum. And in that museum will be the artifacts that we've found at the Berry site, at the Catawba Meadows site, and that have been found at other sites in our county. Um, we have been loaned, given, and have received a lot of artifacts from other people in the community so we think it's an honor that we've been asked to keep these to safely and hopefully um, when we get this building renovated we'll be able to um, open it to the public where you can see those we hope as soon as we get um, the houses going and volunteers will be building these houses we've already had three workshops on tool making and some of the people, when they were doing the palisades, actually used the stone tools to cut the points on the, the logs for the palisades. Um, but we'll, um, we'll have more workshops later on. We've had that one. We've had a pottery, a Native American pottery workshop with a pit firing of the pottery out there. And um, of course, the Saturday that we had our little open house, we had. Um, we, we worked on the Palisades. So I look forward, uh, the entire board and the volunteers of Jawara look forward to 
this joint effort with the city and and we hope to have the two houses and the palisade and the where the village completed within two years thank you we look forward to working with you in, in the city and uh, on both uh, digs of course but I want to, Alfred Hamer and Sidney Simmons were with me down there at the Palisades when they were putting it's them hot. up it was hot yeah very hot but the young uh, the young fellow who was uh, with the uh, uh, the handmade hatchet I guess yeah. Yeah. was cutting the point on the the wood the it's, it, it's amazing that that's how hard it was uh, I thought they were going to bring out the chainsaw, but they didn't. <laughs> so thank you for being. Any You're questions welcome. of Rachel? Thank you. Thank you very much. Look forward to the 18th. Thanks. Andy Hearn. He's one. There going, councilman, ladies. Good to see you, Andy. I think you have a copy in your hands of my request, but for the purpose of the listening audience or viewing audience and those here, I'll be glad to read this if with your permission. Thank you for the opportunity to approach my city council with my concern. I do so as a private citizen of this city to request your public recognition of what I believe to be an outstanding performance of professionalism on the part of a city employee, Sergeant Tico Moss of the Morning Department of Public Safety. As you probably remember in the good old days of yesteryear, I was employed as a News Herald photographer those were the days when the title of Bloody Burke was being formed, and as photographer of the News Herald, I was also ex officio photographer for all local and state law enforcement agencies and emergency services in the county, as well as an active member of the Burke County Rescue Squad. In those years, there were very few incidents at which I was not present, often in both capacities, so I became instinctively familiar with the daily works of the emergency services agencies and provided literally thousands of photographs for their use. In April of this year, the Morning Department of Public Safety was performing a license check on Avery Avenue, during which a subject maliciously attempted to flee. Two officers gave pursuit and Sergeant Moss joined in. During this time, it was blatantly obvious that the fleeing subject had absolutely no regard for others in his path. Sergeant Moss assessed the degree of seriousness and the real possibility of imminent catastrophe and danger to the public, and using his best training, his past knowledge and experience, and the professionalism of his position, he stepped up to the plate and coordinating with his fellow officers, he executed a calculated maneuver to place his patrol car in front of the fleeing vehicle to help clear the traffic ahead. The subject responded by striking Sergeant Moss's vehicle, causing an accident, and again Sergeant Moss called upon his training expertise to control that situation as well. The subject was immediately arrested on the scene by the accompanying officers. Thanks to Sergeant Moss's good judgment, and the professional performance of his duties, an untold amount of personal injuries and property damage was avoided. When it came time, he stepped up and did his job, and I am thankful for this man and for his commitment to his job. I think he deserved recognition by this city council for an excellent performance of his duties as a Morning Department of Public Safety officer. I make no suggestion as to what that recognition should be. That's up to you if you so choose. I apologize for my delay in approaching this council on this matter. I've been provincially hindered heretofore. I sincerely appreciate, appreciate your kindness in letting me speak to you on this matter. Sincerely, Andy Hearn. Andy, yeah, thank you for bringing it to our attention. Of course, we, uh, uh, Tico is, is a great part of our Department of Public Safety. Many of the members are with us tonight, uh, and we will, uh, we will work on that, I promise. I thank you, thank you for being here with us. Appreciate it. Chief Talbert Seth Hawkins. and Seth I think he walked out okay sir <laughs> mr. mayor members of the council city manager city staff and members of the viewing audience, both present here tonight and at home. I'd like to take a moment and talk to you about an, an incident that happened on May the 19th of 2012 involving several officers, members of the emergency services family, as well as the rescue squad. And that's why they're here tonight with us. Uh, I didn't bring them with me because I was expecting trouble, 
but if we have any, I think you can take care of it. So anyway, um, I'm going to address the, uh, the incident itself with a brief summary and then hand it off to Dr. Seth, Seth Hawkins to address it further. At approximately 0121 hours on 519 of 2012, Officer Shane Fulp was on patrol and noticed a white Toyota Camry stopped on College Street near Fleming Drive, just below the department. When Officer Fulp approached the vehicle, he noticed the driver, later identified as Wanda Clay, was slumped over unconscious. He immediately notified our communications center of the situation and checked Ms. Clay for vitals. He did not detect either. At that time, Sergeant Mike Ferraro arrived on scene and helped Officer Fulp remove Clay from the vehicle. Sergeant Ferraro had, notified, had communications to notify the EOC Emergency Operations Center and to, to respond to emergency traffic, which is to us, 1018, um, and to respond to emergency traffic to that location. He also had Engine 2 respond with a defibrillator. As Sergeant Ferraro and PSO Fault began, uh, began to administer CPR, Sergeant Brad Buchanan, PSO Michael Gates, and PSO Stacy Huffman arrived. Sergeant Buchanan assisted with retrieving an AMBU bag and helped give breaths while PSO Fulp and PSO Gates took turns during these compressions. Engineer Frank Braswell, who was operating Engine 2, arrived with an AED or defibrillator. One shock sequence was administered and the Burke County EMS, who is in attendance again here tonight with us, arrived. Officer Fulp. Officer Huffman and Officer Gates assisted with the chest compressions and breaths until the EMS personnel took over. The conclusion of this, I am happy to say, is that Miss Wanda Clay left the hospital last Thursday. And I cannot tell you how it makes you feel as a department head. Unfortunately, this is often not the outcome in these situations. However, I do believe it's clearly the actions of these quick thinking officers of doing their jobs, but not only doing their jobs, but going above and beyond what is expected of them in the line of duty. And that's why Ms. Clay is here with us today. At this time, I'll recognize Dr. Hawkins, let him have a few words. Thank you, Chief. Thank you all for letting me join you and participate in the description of this um, event. Those of you who know me will be surprised to hear. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, so I, I became interested in the law enforcement provision of medical care about 10 years ago. And at that time, I started a study looking uh, across the country at what agencies were providing medical care, in particular defibrillation, and ended up uh, getting a statistical survey of 43,000 agencies across the country uh, that ended up being published in the journal Resuscitation. So we got a very good sense of what is being done as far as the state of the art for defibrillation in our country um, as provided by law enforcement officers. And I got to tell you, you guys are on the cutting edge. Uh, what we found was that um, although uh, the vast majority of agencies wanted to deploy AEDs and wanted their officers uh, and law enforcement personnel to have this ability, and although 10 times more agencies were actually delivering that service to their communities, less than a third of the uh, communities that um, that uh, we surveyed were actually using AEDs by law enforcement officers. So what this means is that in Morganton we really are on the cutting edge of that type of medical care for our uh, citizens. What's more important to know is it's not cutting edge because it's um, not wanted. Most of the agencies we talked to wanted this uh, tool. And it's not cutting edge because it's controversial as to whether it helps or not. Uh, we actually reviewed the science in this as well and demonstrated that AEDs have been shown to be very cost effective and medically sound um, as far as a strategy for preventing loss of life in communities. So you guys are doing it because it's the right thing and you chose to step forward when much of the country hasn't. So folks, the reason why it's so important is this is a medical condition where the survival rate of people experiencing this type of cardiac rhythm decreases by 10% for every minute that that defibrillator isn't applied. So if your heart is in this fibrillatory pattern, Every minute that goes by, up to 10 minutes, your chance of survival drops by 10% to the point where you're not resuscitatable. The difficulty we face as strategists in dealing with this condition is that our, our excellent EMS providers are often more than 10 minutes away from a, a, a scene and from a patient. So what we have to do is find strategies to get these tools applied to the patients at the time that they, uh, that they go into this particular rhythm. 
And that's where uh, these gentlemen come in. And this is just a tool. All this is is a little bit of box with metal wiring and things you apply. And it's a little tricky, but not so hard to figure out. It's, it's actually doctor proof, even. Um, <laughs> What happened here was less. Uh, it was certainly important that the AED was there and was available, but what I think really happened here was that uh, these individuals and law enforcement personnel um, uh, had their street smarts, on, street smarts on, were aware of what was going on, were uh, patient and citizen oriented, and stepped forward to use the tools that they had. And I'm just proud that we were able, as a city, to provide them with those tools that in the end allowed a woman to walk away from, uh, from this situation alive, which is our, our greatest goal all the time. Uh, we actually are going to get some national attention for this. Uh, we submitted this case to the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Association based in Pittsburgh. Uh, they've issued, uh, they agreed that this was a sudden cardiac arrest save that was textbook for how the system is supposed to work. And they sent uh, us pins, sudden cardiac arrest pins that I think are going to be awarded to the personnel involved at a, at a later time. But they're sharp and good looking. <laughs> And what's most important is they have a little numeral one on them, meaning you get more when you get more saves. So this is only the beginning. And uh, I think the other real important factor of this case is that uh, the uh, uh, units that came eventually had an AD available. I think there's uh, proposals on the table uh, to ensure that more AD penetration is available, that more units are equipped with AEDs. I think this is a perfect case to demonstrate um, how important that is because to have somebody walk away from a lethal condition, uh, essentially unscathed, and to walk out of the hospital days later uh, is a testimony to how important this is. We call it the chain of survival because there are many links, and this woman wouldn't have walked out of the hospital without the efforts of others involved. So I thought the uh, Burke County Rescue Squad personnel that are here, if there are any, should step forward. Uh, as well as the EMS personnel that, uh, that arrived on the scene. I think they're here as well. They're just being bashful. <laughs> and uh, the patient was taken to our local hospital where they underwent therapeutic hypothermia, which is, again, is a cutting edge technique to cool the body. And they were flown by Med Center Air, our local helicopter system, to Carolina's Medical Center, where they underwent the best care in the world uh, available at that tertiary care center. So truly, in the eyes of the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Association, this wouldn't be an example of every chain in the link, or every link in the chain of survival from the very first person arriving at the scene to the physician discharged the patient doing the right thing for. What I think really needs to be emphasized, and what I think all these uh, folks behind me who do this every day would emphasize, is that the law enforcement personnel in this particular instant were the tipping point. And in those first two or three minutes, the ultimate outcome was really determined. And everybody after that was finessing the work that they did. So I'll uh, step aside now. I appreciate the time. And I think we owe a round of applause to the law enforcement personnel uh, involved. And maybe we can address it directly. If I could, please, I would like to ask, uh, as I name the officers, ask that you step up and, and go behind this podium over here as I call you out, please. Uh, let me start with, uh, first of all, let me recognize Captain Loudermilk. This is his platoon, and it was his narrative that I read and prepared <laughs> for you here. So, Captain, if you would, step over to the podium, please. Um, Officer Shane Fulp, PSO Shane Fulp. Sergeant Mike Ferraro. Sergeant Brad Buchanan. Officer Michael Gates. Officer Stacy Huffman. And Engineer Frank Braswell. Joshua, any chance you can put everybody in front here and take one picture or is your lens big enough? Why don't everybody, all y'all come over here uh, in front. Yeah. People right. first. Yeah. And everybody, our uh, guys, take, try to get. They can take a separate one yeah. first. One, one picture? Yeah, have yes. one of each. Yeah, one of each. And then one join or whatever. Yeah. yeah. Do that. Yeah.
one, two, three, everybody's happy. <laughs> Everybody smiling. A separate picture of the yes, EMS. Don't be shy. Everybody's still happy. One, two, three. All right. All right. EMS. Amazing story, and uh, and I, I hope that the and I'm sure the media will give uh, all of these uh, the full story to uh, let all the people hear it on the radio and see it in the newspaper. And thank you a lot, and Doctor, thank you for being with us. I appreciate everybody. Chief, you have anything else, or Seth, do you have any? I will de I'll defer just a moment to uh, EMS representative here. Let him introduce himself and. Uh, Okay. Uh, to, the, to the council and everybody in attendance, we, this is D's shift. It works for the county. I'm the shift training sergeant. My name's Tripp Cordell. Been with the county since 2002. I've run several cardiac arrests. Just to make it clear, if it wasn't for the officers on that scene that night, again, this woman would have left. It would have been 100% mortality. So, again, I think they deserve all the credit, not us. We do it every day. So, again, give them a round of applause. Thank you all very much. Public safety at the finest, and I mean that sincerely. Thank you all very much. And I will say a side issue. Frank Brazel saved my mother twice many years ago. Uh, she's no longer with us, Frank, but, uh, but I'll never forget you. Anyone willing and wanting to leave, y'all are welcome to leave. <laughs> <laughs> willing. <laughs> Doesn't include department heads. <laughs> Not too sure. <laughs> Not too sure. Okay, uh, Sally, Sandy, the propo our proposed budget for the fiscal year 2012-2013. Um, this is our budget presentation evening, and as usual, Karen is going to help me out with the technical part of this. We have a PowerPoint that hopefully will put up some of the numbers and some of the discussion as it goes on. Um, I know sometimes I, I talk longer than some people want to hear, but I'm presenting tonight a, a $65.7 million budget for fiscal year 12-13 and would like to share some of the highlights, or at least what I consider the highlights in that budget. Um, we'll start off by telling you that um, the budget appears on its surface to be about 16% less than the current year's revised budget that we're working under. That's a bit deceiving because in the current year, we have an $11.4 million waste treatment plant project, the state revolving loan project that we've been dealing with now for some months. And that one is a little unusual. And so our budgets aren't usually that high. So once adjusted for that, we're looking at a budget that's really 2% less than the budget that we were dealing with this year. Um, couple of things about this. The budget that you're seeing, and again, that is $65.7 million, is um, a responsible budget, I believe. And in that budget, we'll remind everyone that there are 48 full-time city positions that remain frozen. In essence, in other words, they are not funded in the budget that is presented to you tonight. And that is equal to 15% of the workforce 
as per how many allocated positions you have established to perform the services that the citizens in Morganton enjoy. We're going to talk a little bit later about the capital in this budget and that is one of the things that has changed and one of the things that we are looking at doing slightly different from the past couple of years or at least the last two or three. But I want to talk about that as we talk about it relative to each of the funds. We'll um, begin by talking a little bit about our partnerships. They're very important in this community. And we have several longstanding partnerships and other entities that we work with. And we have funded those partnerships. Last year they took a 10% cut in their funding. This year we are recommending funding Burt Development, which is our county economic development arm, 268697 the library, 217727 That includes a capital request at the library of $23,750. That piece will be dependent upon Burke County. Um, Burke County has been asked to fund that same amount for some renovations and some necessary work at the main library. That will only happen, of course, if Burke County does the same. Uh, the narcotics tax. Oh, incidentally, let me also mention that Scott and his folks still maintain the library grounds each year, and we estimate that to be about worth $5,000. And that's at the main library. Uh, the Burke County Narcotics Task Force, and we fund that $20,000 a year. That is included in this budget. And then the Foothills Regional Airport, included in this budget, is the $52,166. That also will be dependent upon our other funding partners and what they end up doing after everyone's budgets are approved. Now I'll talk a little bit about the general fund and, and that's, that's the fund that we most all equate with general government services. And that's the fund where public safety, public works, recreation, uh, the administrative departments of the city are housed, everything that is non-utility. So we'll talk about that first. That's the fund of taxes, sales taxes, ad valorem taxes, and, and all the taxes that we think about. The budget proposed to you is $18,801,663. That is $687,000 less than the budget that we are working under currently. The one thing I will say about that in 11-12, we were very fortunate in being able to obtain almost a million dollars and with the one that you just approved tonight over a million dollars in rural center grant funding to help some of our economic development projects and to be able to help some of our industry that was looking to reuse some old buildings to be able to do that so the current budget is a wee bit inflated because that number is included in there and that's not something that happens for us each year um, will tell you that there is no service that we are currently providing that is proposed to be eliminated or cut next year or any change in the service level that we are currently delivering. The capital budget in the general fund, and this is one of the, the changes, um, you're well aware that um, we have been going through several years of, of an economic crisis and I think crisis is probably not too strong a word, nationally at the state, at the local level. And while I don't think that we have come out of that completely, I do think that we've reached the point where we need to start looking toward the future and we need to be making some decisions that help us look toward that and move this ship toward that and to do some of the things that are going to position us to be able to move out of the economic downturn and to react and be the kind of community that we are all proud of. One of those ways is in this budget, the general fund capital budget, which has been very slim for several years. Um, presented to you are several projects. We took our field trip and we went to visit a lot of these because these include some facilities improvements and some improvements at the facilities, the public facilities that people use. That includes some wayfinding signage that will help carry out our branding and also allow people, visitors and folks who live here, the ability to be able to get around town better. Um, replacement of a 26-year-old HVAC system at Comma. 
um, hopefully installing an elevator at Collett Street Rec Center, some very necessary renovations at the bathhouse at the Collett Street Pool. Several of these projects are things that we have looked at for several years, postponed, and decided not to do relative to the economic times that we've been facing. A replacement of some public safety vehicles, some paving projects, a much needed uh, replacement of a street sweeper, and some new kitchen equipment at the community house. So that's the highlights of the capital projects included in the general fund. Um, we'll tell you that those capital projects total a million eight, one million eight hundred eighty-three thousand eight hundred and fifty dollars. The proposed budget before you does include a recommendation and for your consideration a two cent tax rate increase. The tax rate in Morganton currently is 46 cents, um, recommending that that be increased to 48 cents. One cent on the tax rate generates approximately $153,000, so a two cent tax rate increase would generate about $300,000. You'll recall that for the last several years, we have been talking about our ad valorem tax levy. And what that means is the total valuation of property in the city of Morganton that it's taxable has been going down. And that has been consistent. And that is without a revaluation of property, without a change in the tax rate. And this year is no different. Um, we have been watching a constant decline in that number. The good news is that last year, between the previous year and the current year that we're in, we saw that decline at about 185000 This year, we are projecting that to be $57,260. So it appears that we may be moving in the right direction, that we're starting to see some reinvestment in, in our big industry and our big businesses. It appears that they are starting to invest again in some capital purchases and some personal property and equipment. Um, still concerned, however, that that has not bottomed out, and, and that is a concern. Um, we'll go on to the next thing, the privilege license taxes, oh, well, we'll come to downtown tax in just a minute. Um, privilege license taxes, that, that is another topic that we have talked about over the last several years. That is included in this budget at $266,000. That includes $107,000 for video gaming businesses, something that we have been doing for the past couple of years that has had a lot of attention and a lot of efforts um, by the state to declare whether that's truly a business or not. It is still operating as a business. It also includes um, the second step in what was recommended by the Citizens Advisory Committee that worked on some revenue issues and looked at the possibility of us changing our privilege license billing system and assessment system from a flat fee system to a gross receipt system, which is used by lots of um, cities in the state of North Carolina. Included in this $266,000 is $67,000, which is an estimate for enacting the second phase of that. Last year, you changed the flat fees and took the suggestion of the committee, and you decided to do that in phases and to study a bit longer the gross receipts piece of that, and, and I believe we've done that, and we are estimating somewhere in the range of $67,000 of revenue it's included in your budget presented to you tonight for going the next step and enacting the full gross receipts method of privilege license taxes. Okay. The other thing that I will say, the downtown tax, the special downtown tax, municipal service district tax is 14 cents per hundred dollars value and that is not recommended to change. It is recommended to stay at 14 cents and that generates about $114,000 annually. The next item for your consideration, which is a big ticket item in the general fund, is the solid waste fee, or as most of us know it, the garbage fee. Um, currently, that is $8.50 a month, recommending that that would increase in July to $10 a month. At the time that you establish this fee, 
we said that we would pay for 76 percent of the cost to provide sanitation services and that's that's everything that includes debris removal rough trash limbs loose leaves bag leaves and backyard residential trash pickup which we still do one time a week um, that we would support 76 percent of that operation with the fee and in order to do that that fee needs to be set at ten dollars a month 24% still supported by general tax revenues, sales tax, and all of the other fund, the revenues in the general fund. That's kind of the general fund and, and what is proposed to you there. We'll now take a look at each of the individual utility funds and we'll start with the electric fund. Um, the electric fund is a $33 million budget, $33.1 million is proposed to you. It's a 7% increase over last year, and that's made up largely of a wholesale rate increase, and then also some increased capital, and we'll talk about both of those items. As you are very well aware, and as we were reminded again last week at the regional meeting where the CEO of Electricities came, um, for the past 12 years, we have been passed on to us a wholesale rate increase. So each of the past 12 years, we have had a cost increase in the amount that we pay for the electricity. Um, you want to do that one more? Yeah. This year's recommended rate increase, and that is based from the power agency on all the 19 cities. Everybody is a member of that, and what they are seeing is their growth. So effective July 1, they are passing on to us a 5.3% wholesale rate increase. Morgan doesn't grow at the same rate as all the other cities. So when we take a look at what we're growing, the, the rate at which we're growing, how our electric load is reacting, and we look at the 5.3%, we believe that our actual increase is going to be 5.5%. So we are recommending that you pass that 5.5% on effective with the July 1st, 2012 electric billing in order to keep us whole and to allow us to make those payments. For an all-electric residential customer, a typical customer, that's $0.22 cents a day, $6.67 per month. And again, that would be effective July 1st, 2012. Also in the electric fund this year, um, the capital budget includes two projects that, that are larger than usual for us, and one of those deals with Exit 105 and the util I'm sorry, that is really Enola Road. I don't know why I had you put Exit 105. That is actually Exit 104, and that is Enola Road, and the cost to relocate um, those lines is 758 estimated at $758,371. It's important to note that DOT will be reimbursing us for that cost and the revenue for that is also included in your budget. Then the new retail development, Morganton Heights, the cost to get electric utility service there is $220,000 for phase one of that and that's included in our electric capital budget as well. The water fund this year is $5.6 million. Um, that's a bit less than the current year. You'll recall that we just completed a fairly large or awarded the bids and are in the process of doing a fairly large, almost a $2 million capital improvement at the water plant. So this reflects a decrease in the capital for next year. Um, in looking at that, recommend that you consider a five cents per 1,000 gallon increase in the volume charge for water. That would become effective January 1, 2013. And again, that would be a five cent increase in the volume charge, no increase in the fixed charges. A typical household that uses 6,000 gallons a month in water would see an increase at that five cents of 30 cents per month. And again, that would be effective in January of 2013 as recommended. Capital projects included in there are replacement of a generator, a 20-year-old generator at the water plant, and then the removal of the Mountain View water tank and the construction of a monopole for communications at that site. And that's 375,000. Those are the two large capital projects included in the water fund recommendation this year. 
The wastewater fund recommendation, uh, the budget for that is $6 million. You can see that is quite a bit less than the $17 million of this year, remembering again that that $11.4 million project is included in this year. So that's a 65% decrease. And um, that seems rather large, but again, it's all relative to that one large project that is going on. Recommend that in the wastewater fund that you consider a $0.10 cents per thousand gallon increase in the volume charge. Again, that's recommended to become effective January 1, 2013. That same residential customer or inside the city customer that would be using 6,000 gallons a month would see that increase 60 cents a month on their bill. No increases in fixed charges. Um, much less capital in next year's budget than we looked at this year because we are still working on the $11 million project and concentrating on getting that done. Two things worth noting, um, upgrade to the Lost Corners pump station, that's $100,000 and that is included in the recommendation. And then a sewer rehab program, and we've talked about this in relation to the large sewer project and in relation to beginning to rehab some of the older lines and to take care of some of the infiltration and leakage issues where actually stormwater leaks into our system and finds its way to the waste treatment plant and we are having to pay to treat that. So this is the beginning of what we hope to be an annual program where we set aside funding to begin rehabbing the older lines that are out there and we've included $200,000 for that. The cable fund, bright spot for second year in a row. Um, that is a $4.4 million, almost a $4.5 million budget for next year. It's an increase of about $100,000 or 2% over the budget we're working under this year. Does have included in that a recommended rate increase, again, that would be effective January 1 of 2013. That's $3 per month in basic cable. That would take the rate from $57.95 to $60.95 again in January of 2013. No recommended increases for internet or telephone services are included in your recommended budget. For the second of the three-year plan, uh, the cable budget does reimburse the general fund, the electric fund, and the capital reserve fund for the monies that had been borrowed during the times that we were paying such a high debt service. So that continues that payback schedule. And other than that debt, the cable fund has no other debt. Uh, the other thing that I'll say about that, another charge, and, and it's not on the PowerPoint because it just dawned on me, um, another thing that, that we have asked and included in this budget is a, a reimbursement. It's really a payment in lieu of taxes. It's $58,000, and that would be the same. Compass would pay, in essence, a tax bill to the general fund just like if Charter or any other Time Warner or any other private cable company owned the system that we have. They would be paying a public service company tax bill. And so we have instituted that in the Compass budget and have recommended that you consider that. That basically makes them act very much exactly like a privately owned cable company. The cemetery trust fund is the trust fund where we accumulate funds and, and, and take perpetual care of the cemetery. Um, that budget is $22,825 and does include using $10,000 from that fund to help fund the current expenditures and, and the current maintenance of that for the next year. The intergovernmental service funds, which includes our warehouse function, our garage function, and our IT, our, our information resources as we call them. That total budget is $1.9 million, and that $1.9 million is included in the $65 million cost that you've looked at, and that is a decrease of almost $190,000 over the previous, the current year that we're working in. A um, little bit about personnel. As we indicated early, we have 48 frozen positions, and this budget includes maintaining those 48 frozen positions. Uh, does include a 1% COLA, a cost of living increase for city employees. That would become effective if you choose to do so January 1st of 2013. 
The total cost for that 1% call in next year is $53,544, and that is citywide. Has the employees continuing to contribute the monthly $10 toward their health insurance and continues to um, fund the law enforcement spe special separation allowance. Uh, retirement funding has gone down a bit, um, partially because the state's re required contribution was reduced a little and also because we have 48 positions that are now vacant that we are no longer funding retirement or any other benefits for. Um, that's kind of the nuts and bolts in, in all of the different funds that, that make up the City of Morganton budget. I um, noticed that, that Julie had quoted me and, and I had said in my budget message that I felt like Bill Murray and that I was stuck in Groundhog Day because it seems like for the last handful of years that the message has been the same and that the message has really been stagnant revenues, increasing cost, we have been through a period where recognizing that and recognizing the need to sustain the city services and to keep providing those to the citizens of Morganton because they deserve them. Um, we have been in a mode of, I'm going to call it survival. Um, several things have happened over those years to make that happen. We had two years of furloughs and salary reductions for employees. We have had a hiring freeze now that's been in place for three years and next year we'll make that year four. We have looked at changing benefit structure and we have lessened some of the benefits that employees get. We have looked at funding increased costs in utility funds by increasing some of our rates as we have gotten increased costs passed on to us for that. This budget does look toward raising some of the fees that we charge in the general fund to help pay for those costs and it does recommend a tax rate increase. I know that that is difficult to stomach and I know that is a difficult thing to think about doing in a time where we have been in such a depressed economic period, and a rather lengthy one, I might add. We have delayed equipment purchases. We have put off capital projects. We have decided not to make investments in our facilities. We have continued, however, with our partnerships and with opportunities to get grant funds, working with BDI, securing um, rural center grants, and in looking, working with Burke County. We have been very fortunate in, in the last year to year and a half, and we have been able to announce industrial jobs, 585 new jobs, and $53 million of capital investment. And that's pretty nice when you consider the economic time that we've been through. And then you might say, well, then why do you need to raise taxes if all that good has happened? Well, that doesn't equate into a direct tax dollar. That has not happened yet because as we just talked about, the tax levy, which is the dollar amount based on assessed value that we have available for collection has gone down yet again. We are very fortunate in this community. I don't know if you drive around like I do and you notice that there is heavy equipment and bulldozers and you name it and they are on every corner working. Um, it is nice to see that activity. We have major construction projects going on. Exit 105, a new Broughton Hospital. Exit 104 is getting ready to get started. All of those are state projects and we are thankful for those state projects. We have had to really buckle down and we are contributing a lot of dollars toward those with utility line relocations and helping to make those projects work and to make them successful for our community. We are grateful for the state involvement here because that really solidifies the state of North Carolina as continuing to be a large employer here. We have fought for the school for the deaf and I think that, knock on wood, um, that the school for the deaf appears to be safe. And, and that's the first time in a long time and we are grateful for that. Let me remind everyone that all of that activity and all that investment in state property and in state projects, while a very good thing for our community, it does not add value to the tax base of this community. 
There are a lot of benefits associated with it, but it is not a direct tax benefit to the city of Morganton. But we do provide services to those institutions. We do provide services to everyone that benefits from those state road projects. The other thing is we have a, a large retail project going on, and that is a happy thing. I think that ultimately that will pay dividends in our sales taxes. We're going to have some challenges as, as that gets done, and we look at some other areas of town, and they're going to need some work on them too. So we have to think about how we're preparing ourselves to do that. We've had tremendous efforts in marketing and tourism development. I think we have been successful in the community, and that's all done with a partnership. I think we've benefited. We have natural beauty here that is, is you can't really find it everywhere, not many places. We have attractions. We have special events, and our events are good, and that brings people here. And we are trying to let more people know about them. You've heard about a lot of them tonight, partnering with Jawara, doing different things at Catawba Meadows, a lot of things that make this community what it is. Budget season is tough. It doesn't get any easier. We talk about this every year. Some, soon we're going to sit up here and we're going to say that it was a little easier. I just don't know exactly when that's going to be. Um, you know we've spent a lot of time talking and working through this season and looking at what our options are. You have given us guidance and you have participated in those conversations and I know that you also anguish over the decisions that ultimately have to get made because when we decide that we're going to put a budget together, we're going to continue the services that we all enjoy, that we all expect, there's a cost associated with that. And unfortunately, you all have to make the decision as to how much that cost is going to be. We'll tell you that, as always, the department heads take this process seriously. They participate in this process like professionals, and for that I am grateful. Um, as always, I have to thank Karen. She keeps me on the path. She keeps me on the narrow. She keeps me... Um, in, in the days when it's very hectic, she keeps me focused and she keeps me moving forward so we get this together. I really appreciate that and thank her for that. I know you've heard enough. I have one more thing. I see your eyes rolling. Um, <laughs> last year I talked a lot about partnerships and we talked a little bit about that tonight. What I hope that this budget message and this budget brings to the table is a recognition of how important those partnerships are. I hope that it brings together the fact that for the community that we all love, that we all want to keep, it takes that partnership's commitment. And the partners are the citizens, the business owners, the elected officials, the public employees that provide the services, the visitors that come and enjoy our community. And everybody in that group has a role to play in that. And everybody in that group, I believe, has to share in the successes and the really good things that we achieve, and they have to share in the burdens and that means that for it to work, everybody has to pay a little bit toward the cost of getting it all done. I think this budget does that. I think it does that responsibly. And I would ask that you consider calling for a public hearing on it on June the 18th at 6 o'clock p.m. in this room. I would like to uh, thank our city council for being so actively involved in the budget process. It was a learning session for all of us and more so for one of our members everybody seemed to uh, work hard at it and uh, we all uh, we all learned an awful lot Karen I want to thank you and Sally for what you've done to make this I believe it's a good budget that has been put together and it begins a little bit of the process of doing some capital things that we needed to do three years ago but we couldn't do them and last year we couldn't do them and we've got to make the investment I want to thank the department heads of course for working with us because they came to the meetings that we were at uh, so I greatly appreciate that uh, I make a motion I'd like to call for the public hearing on a proposed budget on Monday June 18th 2011 at uh, uh, 6 p.m. in the council chambers in this room second 2012 2012 Ooh. 2012. Well, it would help for that to yeah. be 2012. yeah it would have been next last year be hard to come last year <laughs> Uh, see, okay. Uh, all in, did I ask for the motion? I mean, a motion I made. Did I ask for all in favor say aye? Aye. Uh, any discussion? All in favor say aye? No. 
No? Okay. I guess that 11 threw me for a loop. Sorry. Sorry. All right. Sorry. Sorry. We've had too many numbers bouncing around. Okay, so public hearing will be June 18, 2012, 6 p.m. in these chambers. New business. Before we get too far, yes, I, I got sure. a couple questions I'd yes, like to ask. One, we're talking about water and sewer, 90 cents a month increase. Yes, sir. 667 power increase. For an all electric home. All electric. Well, I think everybody knows how I feel about property tax. If we need an increase, I think that's where it ought to be because everybody has to have water and everybody has to have electric. And I think it's I think it's a fair way than only taxing uh, uh, more than the two cents. I, I'm kind of satisfied with the two, <laughs> the two cent tax increase, but going more than that, I think that that's not fair. And I got one more question. I don't know whether this is the time to ask it or not. I know that we've got a lot of, of institutions that are tax exempt. Uh, Broughton Hospital, Western Carolina Center, the hospital. We furnish uh, fire protection. We furnish backup police protection. Uh, I'm aware that they kind of make a donation, I guess is the correct term to use for it. And I am also have been told that they kind of cut their donation back. My question is, when it gets to where we feel like we're losing money by furnishing this, what are we going to do? The, the State General Assembly makes, a, or at least in the past, <laughs> they have made an appropriation, an annual appropriation, which is basically like a payment in lieu of taxes from the state institution. So it's state revenue that comes to us to pay for the fire protection at the state institutions and the, the backup police protection and what we do. Um, Several years ago, maybe three years ago, when was that increase? It was a little bit more than that. Three or four years ago, there was an increase in that. And it went up from, I believe, like around 98 or so thousand dollars a year to $107,000 a year. That is calculated based on a formula that they use. We have no input into that. Um, two years ago, they started reducing that amount as they were looking at budget troubles. And that amount was reduced to? 10, 11, well, in 910, as you said, it was 107, 911. In 1011, it was 80,933. This year, 75,833. And uh, we have no, we haven't heard officially what it's going to be next year, but we assume it will stay at that level. But we have been told that currently in the budget talks that it stays at the 75000 That is one of the issues that we talked about with our representative, with, with Representative Blackwell and our Senator Warren Daniel, when we had a meeting before they went back to Raleigh. And one of the things that we have put out there as one of our issues, because we're not the only community in that situation, obviously Boone. I mean, they have a large university, Chapel Hill. I mean, there are communities that provide similar services to state institutions and um, don't know how successful we'll be at trying to get them to increase that back up to a reasonable rate. But currently, we do feel comfortable that at least at this point, it's in at the same 75 and we're not going down yet again. Well, I know we've got some idea of when it gets to that point, we start losing by doing it. I just wondered what we're going to do. <laughs> That's an interesting question. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep, very much so. Okay, uh, we've called for the public hearing. I'll open up, I'm sorry, I'm going to open up a public hearing on economic development incentives for James Tool Machine and Engineering Incorporated. Sally. Mm -hmm. Um, this is another very positive, and this is an opportunity that we have to work with a local company who is looking toward expanding and hiring employees and making investment in their facilities. We have been working with BDI in Burke County. Um, James Tool is looking at constructing a new facility. That facility will be at 212 Reap Drive, and that is in order to meet the current demands they have and future demands for their products. 
um, looking at hiring 30 new full-time jobs. It's a 30,000 square foot manufacturing facility and a capital investment of not less than $2.3 million will be required in order for them to get that. Um, recognizing that this is a benefit to the community, would ask that you um, consider an economic development incentive grant. That would be something that the city and the county would jointly do. It is a three-year grant, and it is estimated that over that three years, the city's contribution would be $15,870. Notice of this public hearing was advertised in the News Herald on May the 23rd, 2012. Anyone in the audience wishing to speak for or against the uh, assistance, please uh, stand up and state your name. Where you reside. Thank you, Mayor Council. Scott Darnell with Burke Development. Um, just wanted to say, you know, thank you for the support of the, the public utilities. There's a piece of that that's helping them expand, as well as the council and, and staff. Um, you know, another great success, a local machining company. Uh, Ms. Beth Bertelson, the Chief Financial Officer, has joined us tonight as well. We'll be taking this before the County Commissioner tomorrow night, but another great success. The company continuing to invest in this community, hiring very skilled labor, and, you know, continuing to um, innovate and become a leader in their field. And we're fortunate as a community to have this type of company, but it continues to build on the success of, you know, helping the economy move forward. And again, thanks for your support and uh, consideration for this grant tonight. Thank you. Anyone else? Close the public hearing. Council? We make the motion to approve the economic development and assistant grants with James Tool in Burke County and to allow the mayor and our management to approve any technical amendments required in the execution of this agreement. Okay, we'll have a motion to second the discussion again. All in favor say aye. Uh, other business, consideration of entering into a CDBG small business loan agreement with James Tool Machine and Engineering for the purpose of developing a new manufacturing facility at 214 Reap Drive. Sally. Mm -hmm. um, this is another opportunity that we have to participate and help to stimulate the economic growth of James Tool and serve the greater good of the community. Um, you know with our CDBG funding that we have set aside funds and have been encouraging and concentrating on small business loans that we do through that HUD funding that we get. And before you tonight is consideration of a $15,000 CDBG loan and that is to help them with some of the utility work that is going to be happening in order to serve the new facility and would ask that you consider that tonight. I make a motion to enter into an $18,000 CDBG loan agreement with James Tool Machine and Engineering for the purpose of building a new sewer line to the project. Second. I have a second. If I may interrupt, yes, um, Mr. Mayor, actually that should be because the bid came in lower. It's only a $15,000 loan. Very good. We'll actually be awarding that bid later. We took those bids late Thursday afternoon. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. Fifteen thousand. Okay. okay. Yes. Uh, any other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Consideration of closure to a through traffic of a portion of Mall Street between Bushell Street and Waitstall Street, Sally. Mm -hmm. um, we have a, a, well, a street that doesn't meet standard street standards for normal street building, and that is, is Mall Street, or at least a portion of it. And there have been several accidents that have occurred on this street that doesn't really have a lot of traffic on it. And so um, engineering has taken a look at what could happen in that area in order to make it safer to travel to vehicular traffic. Um, the street actually, when you drive down it, it seems more like an alley than a street. And that's just the feel of it. There has been a meeting with the property owners that um, are adjacent to this street and where it runs. What is being recommended for your consideration is not abandoning this street and not giving up any of the property, but changing the opportunity for vehicular traffic to travel all the way through it by removing a portion of the street and 
constructing some sort of type of barrier, whether that's vegetation or something else, to signal that and then putting up appropriate signage. And that would happen um, down at a point where the southern boundary line of the Stryker Properties LLC track at 104 Mull Street actually touches Mull Street. It's one of the Patterson Street. Oh, I'm sorry, that is Patterson Street. I think. Because it is addressed on the Patterson Street, but you can see on the photograph that you have included, you'll see a white line that crosses the street, and that is where the suggestion is to do that. It would still allow access for all the property owners to every piece of property. It would just not allow through traffic to travel all the way down that street. And Mark Young's here if you have any questions or any more explanation. Move to approve the closure of the through traffic of that uh, portion of Mull uh, Street between Bushell Street and Wachel Street. Second. second. Okay, we have a motion second discussion, and I'd like to make a few comments. Scott, I would like to recommend strongly you don't put any plants in that uh, uh, as a barricade, you know, because uh, with asphalt on both sides a foot and a half, two feet apart, they'll never live, you know that. So hopefully you use bollards or whatever. And uh, this is not going to be, it gives our city attorney a little bit of heartburn when I say this. I'm not going to put it in the motion, but uh, if the ownership of the properties change that are asking for, uh, particularly the building where the uh, full and wider uh, office is and the other property that's owned by a doctor in town changes I would hope that a future city council will look at that and possibly open it up because if they build a building there uh, on that vacant lot that goes over to Patterson from Mull I think it would need to be open but anyway that's for a later situation uh, we have a motion we have a second all in favor say aye, aye. aye. opposed okay <coughs> Uh, consideration of an ordinance establishing a speed limit of 25 miles an hour on, on Ross Street, Sally. Uh, Ross Street is a dead end, densely populated. You also have um, visuals included in your packet so that you can see that. Um, and off Berkmont Avenue, and it's near exit 103 um, to orient you to where that is. There has been several complaints of speeding. Um, we've also gone out there and, and, and Mark and the guys have done an engineering evaluation of this. Currently, there's no speed limit posted there. So by default, that becomes a 35 mile an hour speed limit within the city of Morganton. Recommending that the better choice would be a speed limit of 25 miles per hour. And if we so choose to do that, that we post that in order to make that a little bit safer. Yeah, make the motion to authorize establishing a 25 mile per hour posted speed limit on Ross Street. Second. Have a motion. We have a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Consideration of an engineering services with Black and Beach for phase three. Did I skip one? Oh, skip Forest Hill School, Forest I think. Hill. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Forest consideration Hill. of a safety improvements to Ann Street in the area of Forest Hill School for drop off and pickup of students including necessary <coughs> ordinance revisions to accompany improvements Sally. Mm -hmm. If you have ever picked up kids at Forest Hill School in the afternoon or dropped kids off in the morning you recognize that that it is difficult at best and congested at best and, and so over a period of time engineering public safety there there have been several times over the last bit that we have looked at a way to try to make that better you also once again have included in your packet a, a map that shows you the recommended safety upgrades that that are being talked about in the area um, Staff has worked with the, the principal there, with the school officials, looked at ways, given what you're dealing with in the area, to try to make this as safe and less congested and, and allow the kids opportunities to get in and out of the vehicles at pickup time and drop off time in a safe manner. 
Um, there are several suggestions along with the suggestions that come with that. There's some signage. All that requires some ordinance changes so that all that will be properly signed and able to be enforced. And that's what you have before you. Um, Mark's here if we want to talk about any of the details. I know that we've talked about this at the street committee meeting and the same proposal that was presented at that meeting is before you tonight. I would like to ask Mark to do his thing. I'd make it make it clear for our viewing audience because I've heard about this for several years. <laughs> yes, this has been something that's been ongoing for probably the better part of the time that I've been here. So getting close to five years. Um, what you see on the diagram there, there is no uh, school speed limit uh, in the ordinances for uh, Forest Hill School. So that would have to be one of the uh, uh, ordinance amendments or changes to accompany this. Ann Street would, I'm just going to kind of proceed uh, to the school and, and talk through all the improvements here. So the first thing would be the speed limit being uh, established for the school zone. Ann Street would be um, striped with a double yellow center line uh, down it to clearly delineate that it's two-way traffic on that portion of Ann Street because at Harris Drive then it becomes a one-way street in front of the school. Um, appropriate signage would be put up to indicate use of the lanes as you approach the school. Um, we are changing um, configuration of the lanes at the school. Currently there's parallel parking along the curb uh, in front of the school and then the two through lanes and additional parallel parking on the other side of the street. We are going to be changing that to where pickup can occur at the curb um, so children don't have to walk out between parked cars in order to get to the vehicles. Also this uh, should speed up the pickup process because the teachers will be able to see the parents approaching and uh, identify the student that needs to go with that vehicle and get them to the car. Um, so it should uh, improve efficiency as well as safety. Um, additional signage is required um, because the um, portion of Ann Street there beyond the intersection with Cedar Street would have to be two-way. So a stop bar would have to be uh, put in that location and do not enter sign so we don't have people going the wrong way on Ann Street. And then additional signage would be required along Cedar Street and at the in its intersection with Falls Street in order to accomplish all this. Mark the diagonal reversed angle parking that's shown. Yes. Is that designed for pickup or is that designed for all day parking? Or? It's designed for all day parking. Harris Drive, it's, it hasn't been addressed, but that's typically there's a lot of traffic up Harris Drive at pickup time and parking in yards and that sort of thing. That's complaints that I've had, and I think Mark's aware of, of that. Is that addressed at all? Well, um, I've been out there an awful lot, <laughs> mm -hmm. sitting there watching all this um, for the last four and a half years. Okay. There isn't really all that much parking along Harris Drive. Um, it, what's occurring is a backup from the school up all the way out Ann Street and up Patton Street. Um, people begin showing up well over an hour before pickup time, and so the queue starts to grow. and um, I mean, we're really, we can't, from an engineering standpoint, I can't do anything about that. But what I'm, what I'm trying to do with this reconfiguration is to make the pickup process more efficient and safer. Faster, okay. So try to clear the area of vehicles faster, hopefully. I haven't had a complaint about Harris Drive in a while. <laughs> Are you aware of any parts? Or? have not received any complaints of late, but this lends itself back to the overcrowding issue that that school faces. Uh, they are 
uh, probably about 130 students, I think, 140 now above their intended capacity. So, and it, again, as Mark uh, pointed out, we have parents who show up uh, uh, an hour in advance. They obstruct driveways to some of the residents who live along those, the, the Ann Street and, and Patton Street. And that's where the problems now. Sometimes we've had issues where folks who live on Harris can't get out because the traffic is so jammed up and so they can't get out to turn left to go back into their exit, if you will. Um, and it's just uh, over the years it hasn't been addressed because there hasn't been, uh, I guess you would say there's been differing opinions on how it should be addressed <laughs> and should be handled. That's the best way I know to put it. So we've well tried said. to come to a solution. Well said. Thank you. Well, how are the, the cars going to, are they going to enter on Cedar Street and then go back down and is that what? Other, other way around. Other well, way it around looks like the, the uh, parking places are. That, that's reverse angle parking. You, instead of pulling into a diagonal parking space, yeah. these you pull up and then back into them. That way when you are leaving the parking space, you can pull forward. You have to back into them? Yes, it's like a parallel parking space. Actually, from a safety standpoint, it's better because what happens is when you back into that reverse angle parking space and the doors open, children do not have the ability to go out to the street. The doors are actually blocking their route to the street. So from a safety standpoint, uh, the reverse angle parking is much safer. Got to hear a motion, guys. <clears throat> uh, make a motion to authorize installation of roadway markings and signage on Ann Street as well as Patton Street and Cedar Street as part of the safety improvements of Forest Hill School during the drop off and pick up of students. Furthermore, a motion to revise the city ordinance as necessary to accompany these safety improvements. Second. Motion, second. Discussion. Will these specific ordinances be brought back to us, or that will just be up to the staff to do the ordinances? And they're attached. Oh, okay, I'm sorry. There are revised the city ordinances in the motion. All in favor say. Did we do that? Yeah. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed. Okay. Next item is uh, consideration of engineering services with Black and Beach and for phase three construction of the Catawba River Water Pollution Control Facility, Sally. Mm -hmm. This is the project that we just love to talk about every <laughs> meeting, at least two or three times it seems like. Um, this is obviously the continuation and what is slated to be the final phase of the improvements at the waste treatment plant that are relative to us complying with the special order by consent that we signed with North Carolina Diener. This is the last phase of the $11.4 million construction project. This is the engineering contract for phase three. This is the engineering that takes us all the way through the final construction, the inspection, on-site inspection during the project, any regulatory compliance issues during the project, and also any kind of testing of the uh, the equipment as we start that up. There'll be a materials testing phase as it goes in to be installed and begins to work. The construction pre-conference was held here on May the 24th and there were probably 20 or so people, maybe more in um, attendance at that meeting. That included the engineering company, city staff folks, the contractor, ASHA, the um, regional guy from Diener who will be at every meeting and Asha and the Diener folks will be on site a lot. Um, this is an $847,000 contract. It represents 8% of the total cost, um, has been reviewed and approved by Diener and it comes before you tonight. Make a motion to accept construction phase services agreement with Black and Veatch International Company to provide project management, review of shop drawings and O&Ms, record drawings, resident engineer, 
startup testing, creation, and review of punch list and material testing. Second. So I have a second. Motion and a second. Discussion. Yeah, I want to make a comment on it. Uh, after reviewing this, uh, looking at it in detail, uh, as in some of the previous contracts, uh, I, I definitely feel that uh, some of the labor costs in this are highly inflated. However, uh, I'm told that uh, that these costs are just normal normal costs and the acceptable costs. Uh, uh, that that may be true, but uh, as far as I'm concerned, I feel like the labor costs are highly uh, inflated. And I know there isn't anything we can, we we can do about it. Normal. If they say it's normal cost, then uh, what that really means is if you get somebody else to uh, uh, contract with that does this same kind of service, uh, you're going to pay the same amount. Uh, so we don't have much of a choice here. So uh, I guess I'm kind of objecting to something. I'm going to have to time, wind up just turn right around and voting on it, <laughs> vote in favor of it, because it's normal cost, and, and uh, I understand that uh, the state looks at these contracts and they consider the, the labor cost to be average and normal. Uh, the only difference is that the state's not paying this bill, and but that doesn't make it any easier. So uh, I've had my say on it, and I guess I'm ready to vote. Can, can I say something about that too, Forrest? Because, um, and, and they have, in in. What is required, and the reason that that hourly rate schedule is, is, is included, the state requires that in their review in order to make the loan to us. And, and those rates that they put in here, that, that is not an hourly rate of just salary. I mean, that's not what somebody gets paid. That's an hourly rate that the company charges for the overhead and everything involved in that position, in them making that position available to work on this job. So, so that doesn't exactly equate to a, a salary. It, it basically a, equates to the salary plus all the other costs, whether that's liability insurance, health insurance, um, overhead, travel, things like that, and, and those are the costs that the engineering firm bills per that type of employee at that level of expertise. You get that, don't you? Well, I mean, I, that's the truth, and, and, and the state does have a schedule, and they have a, a schedule with which they will accept those costs in in order to fund this loan. The, the way that engineering costs get looked at on large projects like this is it's usually quoted as a percentage of the project total. Phase three of this project is $10.9 million. And that is what phase three of this project cost. So an engineering for, firm will normally charge you somewhere between 10 and 13%. 10 and 13 percent of total project cost is a normal engineering cost. This engineering cost is 8 percent of that amount. And that's one of the reasons why the state approved that. I don't know if that makes you feel any better or not. Will you sleep tonight? It, it do. doesn't make me feel any better. Yeah, what I, a deal. <laughs> I, I feel about uh, uh, this contract about the way I feel when I pull up to the gas pump. <laughs> You ought to feel a little feel, bit better about that right now. I feel now. like I'm being ripped off. <laughs> so, but. Okay, we have a motion. We have a second. And let's vote. Okay. All in favor say aye. Right. Uh, aye. Opposed? You vote for it first. I did. <laughs> okay. I felt ripped off, too. <laughs> Consideration of a dark fiber lease with Broadplex LLC. Sally. Okay, that is um, a compass contract that we are looking at, and Bill Harkins is here if we need any further explanation. Basically, we have some unused fiber strands in our system, call that dark fiber, and we have some running along Highway 18 and along Highway 64. Broadplex LLC has offered to lease two of those dark fibers on 1.5 miles on 
Highway 64 and 2.5 miles on Highway 18. You have a um, diagram of that included in your materials that show the segments in our system where they'd like to lease those fibers. The term of the lease agreement, the initial term, is 59 months. And for that, there is a price of $6,000 that would be paid to us in a one-time one lump sum payment up front. Um, that amount is in line with what we have paid for similar agreements that we have from Sprint, DukeNet, and other folks that we have leased dark fibers from. Motion to approve the dark fiber use agreement between the City of Morganton and Broadplex LLC. Second. I have a second. Discussion now. I think it would be good if we would just say a little bit about Broadplex. I'm sure that most folks don't know who Broadplex is. Bill, you on? How long have they been in business, Bill? Um, ever since I've been here, they, 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 were, they had lines thrown up around town here. It's just been in the last year or so, they've really, they've put in like 90 million feet of fiber uh, up to date. So they really got going. Um, they seem to be doing it right from everything I've seen. Uh, I've heard a few instances when they started out where they weren't and they've changed their ways and they got all the permits they're supposed to have and so forth. Uh, they basically do a large transport. Uh, their customers are like we would be if we wanted to connect to the worldwide internet. But they're the, we're the kind of customers they want. They don't want residential customers or anything like that. So they, they deal pri primarily in big business. Um, these fibers, it's just an asset that's not being used. Uh, what they want to pay us, the $6,000, is actually about 20% higher than what we, we uh, get from DukeNet. So it, it is in line with what we should get for it. We can get them back anytime we want on a six month notice. Good. And we will, um, of course it'll just be for 10 years. At that point we could look at if they want to continue. They will be using this as a backup. They're putting underground in all the way down South Sterling and on Berkmont. But anytime you put underground fiber in a business district, it's just a matter of time before somebody cuts it. And they want this for a backup in case that happens. I got a question, Bill. Mm -hmm. How did we go about? Did you did you negotiate this price with them, or did we just look at a, at what the standard is and and kind of come up with a standard price? Yeah, I, I knew what we were getting from Duke, which was about a thousand dollars a year. This pays us about twenty percent more. And I talked to Rocco, and that's what we came up with. We thought that was fair. I will say during their project, one of their contractors that is installing fiber on Sterling Street recently cut one of our sewer lines. And um, it is a sewer line that serves Zaxby's. And we had the opportunity to, to meet that challenge and continue providing a restaurant um, acceptable sewer service. And we did that and have received great accolades from Zaxby's for how that has been handled. And their contractor obviously is reimbursing us for the, the cost and, and working to, to fix the sewer line. Tell us how you fix that sewer line <laughs> in continual service. Well, right now it's, it's not completely repaired yet, is it, Don? Correct. Mm -hmm. So we've duct made tape? some other arrangements. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, we actually put a guy out there and stuck his finger in it. We're hoping you'll pull the Mars ship. <laughs> For any amount of money, I'd do it. <laughs> okay, we have, uh, we don't have a motion yet, do we? Yes. Yes, you do. Motion and a second. Yes. You do. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Consideration of award of engineering contract for relocation of the electric utilities on Enola Road. Sally. Mm -hmm. um, the projects continue. Um, this relates to the project we discussed earlier where the electric department is having to relocate 13,000 feet of three-phase electric lines on Enola Road in order to accommodate that widening project. And in order to do that, um, we needed to engage an engineer who will design and oversee that project. Um, three responses were received. And after review of those, the staff is recommending Southeastern Consulting Engineers, and the price for the design is not to exceed $35,000.
North Carolina DOT will be reimbursing us for that cost mm -hmm. in next fiscal year. Okay. Like the motion to award the engineering contract for the relocation of electric utilities on Enola Road to Southeastern uh, Consult Consulting Engineers Incorporated for a price not to exceed $35,000. Second. I have the motion. Have a second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All right, consideration of boards and appointments. So, and we'll go one by one. Uh, table, three vacancies. Okay. Motion to approve Richard Garrison and Mark Scholler to the Cable Television Commission for terms to expire on June the 1st, 2015. Second that. Okay, all in favor say aye. 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 We have one open. Right. And that is, we're waiting on, on a student. recommendation from on Western student. Piedmont. Yeah. Consideration of appointments for boarding commissions, community appearance. That's yours. Those are yours. Uh, all right, uh, Judy Lane Davis and Laura Irvin Smith, uh, Smith are being reappointed. Second. And the vacancy, well, all in favor? No, we don't, don't have to do that. No, that's, that's just yours. That's mine. Okay. Yeah. Consideration of appointments for boards and commissions, fireman supplemental retirement fund. Move to appoint uh, Karen Duncan and uh, John Cantrell to the uh, fireman supplemental retirement uh, fund board for a term to expire on May 21, 2014. And as I always. We get the COLA. Do we get the COLA? <laughs> as I always do, I want to double the money you make on that board from last year's. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All in favor of Karen and John Cantrell, say aye. Uh, aye. Okay. Uh, human relations. My, it's my appointment. I'd like to put Ken Clark, who was recently named Citizen of the Year uh, by the Human Relations Commission, on that board. Uh, and Tico Moss. And Tico Moss, I'm sorry. Moss. Okay, Tico was just taking the place of another gentleman's retiring, I think. Okay, second. Uh, no, you don't have to. That's me. Yeah. Uh, we'll leave off the motion and all that stuff next time. Okay. Main Street are my motions. Jerry Haney and Julia Mode and Tamara Starnes and Chris Jernigan uh, are to be new appointments along with Clark Irwin and Bill Allman be reappointed. That's mine, so no motion. In. And we've in got Bobby one McCombs. more. We have one that is Bobby a McCombs. shorter yeah. term. Bobby McCombs to expire on June 30th. 2013. Uh, yes. My, thing doesn't, my sheet doesn't say that's a mayoral. Mine doesn't either. Oh, you do? Okay. <laughs> okay. There's John, motion. I'm trying to teach her. There are three of them that are mine. <laughs> okay. All right. Consideration of appointments, again, uh, planning and zoning, three vacancies. Mm -hmm. Make the motion to appoint. Reappoint Claude Huffman, Bill Lennon, Waits Corden. Right. Claude, and, uh, Claude Huffman and Bill Lennon are reappointments, re and yeah. uh, Waits Gordon is a new addition to that board and will be yeah. a good addition. Second. Uh, have a second. All in favor say aye. aye. And all three terms are till 2015. Yeah. Recreation advisory, three vacancies. Advisory. Okay, is this yours or is this No, this no, is, is That's anybody. <laughs> anybody and everybody. I was going to appoint Cindy Keenert, Pat Grady, and Bill Hutchins to the Recreation Advisory Commission. All oh. terms to expire on June the 30th, 2015. All in favor say aye. Aye. Consideration of appointments Second. again. Redevelopment, two vacancies. Gonna leave one open and Jerry Norville's to be reappointed. All in favor say Second. Aye. 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 All right, we've got two little items to put on the agenda. Uh, consideration of uh, award of a sewer line extension contract for James Tool Machine and Engineering. Sally. And this is the sewer line we referred to earlier. We took bids on Thursday. The we received three. The lowest bid is from Max Presswood of fourteen thousand six hundred and thirty-five dollars. So we'd ask that you approve us contracting with Max Presswood to do that. Motion to authorize a contract with Max Presswood Water and Sewer of Lenore, North Carolina, to construct the Dixie Boulevard sewer line extension project for James Tool Machine and Engineering. Second. Second. Have a second. All in favor? Uh -huh. Discussion first. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Last item, 
I'll take care of for you guys. I'm not going to turn it over to Sally. And it's just late at night. <laughs> uh, we have, if I can find it in here, on its own back. Let me take care of it for you. you. Oh, I got it. It's consideration of rejection of a water plant generator bid, and it was outbid by a number of companies and overbid and over amount of money. And so a motion to reject all water plant generator bids and direct the staff to rebid the project in second. my motion. I hear a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Anything from the betterment of this community from any of the city council members and staff? Oh, I don't think we as a council can be any prouder than I was tonight to see what happened. That's right. Uh, yeah. And Absolutely. How, how our public safety department responded. Mark, you're to be commended in your department. Without a doubt, Mark. Good job. Mm -hmm. Meetings adjourned.